I think we will repeat the third line two times and the fourth line three times, but I'm sure you know it. It's a familiar tune to do this and we'll stand to sing it through. Verse at a time, 
and then leave a little space for our own individual prayers silently in response to what the psalmist has written. And then I'll offer a short prayer in some of my own words before reading the next verse. So let's pray together. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. Thank you, Lord, that as we meet today, you know us. You know what we've got going on, and you meet us as we are. You know when I sit down and rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. Search out my path, my lying down, and are acquainted with all of my ways. experience your all embracing presence with us. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Spend this time together and with you and in worship. 
let us see things as you do. In Jesus' name. Amen. That picture of light and darkness that the psalmist talks about in the 11th and 12th verses is one that helps me as I think about Jesus' ascension into heaven. His ascension will be celebrated on Thursday and marked by many churches next Sunday. But in the Salvation Army, it's Candidate Sunday next week, so we'll be thinking about something a little different. Instead, we're going to think about that picture of Jesus going up into heaven today, of Jesus ascending into what's often depicted as a bright blue sky with two heavenly figures arriving in bright white clothes. Last year, on Ascension Sunday, I am not expecting you to remember we thought about demythologizing the ascension. And as we did that, we thought about some of the different responses we find in Scripture to Jesus going back into heaven that might help us or might have helped us in our response. But today, we're stripping it back. Like the disciples of Jesus in that moment, we're going to use Jesus' ascension to help us reflect on our experience of his presence with us in the past. We can imagine the disciples thinking about everything that they'd shared and seen with Jesus in that moment as he was going from them. Maybe like we can imagine all the experiences we've shared and seen with a person when we have to say goodbye for whatever reason. Before our time together, in a moment, there's going to be a testimony time for us to share our experiences of where and how we've experienced the God of God's presence. We're also going to think about what Jesus' presence might look like now, continuing to think about what the disciples might have been thinking and feeling in the moment, like, as in this artist's depiction, they watch Jesus' feet ascend into heaven. I don't know how well you can see that image from where you are. If you're sat there in the back, you might be able to turn around and see it behind you, but it's a bit darker there by the looks of it. But we can see all kinds of different reactions on the faces of the different disciples. Some who seem to be smiling, some scratching their head, others holding their head and seemingly covering their eyes. This is a 14th century icon by the anonymous Bohemian painter, the master of my son, or something like that. And then, and then there's the promise of what God's presence with us is going to look like. So there's those three things that we'll have the opportunity to think about during our worship today. God's presence then, and where and how we've experienced his presence with us in the past. God's presence now, and what that looks like and might mean for us. And God's presence when. Looking forward and ahead to all that's promised to Jesus for us. And so to help us as we think about that, we're going to turn to Luke. Like we did last year, and his account of the ascension. But whereas last year we thought about the ascension, as we're told it happens at the end of Luke's Gospel, today we're going to look at Luke's account that comes from the start of Acts. And so there's a reference on the screen if you want to follow along and read along that way. We're going to be reading Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. And if you can see on the screen there, in today's new international version, it comes under the head, Jesus taken up into heaven. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. 
after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After Jesus said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they say, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go. Amen. So, we have the opportunity to think about God's presence then. Not then in terms of the words that we've just read and shared together, but that opportunity for us to share our testimonies, our experiences of God's presence with us. And to help us, we're going to sing song number 912 in the songbook. For those who were here last week or watched the meeting online, you'll have heard the band play an arrangement of this melody after the benediction. And it's a song that reflects on those experiences of Jesus that mean we're able to sing and tell of his love for us and respond by sharing something of our love for him. So we're going to stand, we're going to sing the first two verses through. And then there will be the first opportunity to stand. Thank <laughs> you. 
next.
you know, I've not played that one right once yet, and uh, I can still boast the same record. So uh, thank you to the rest of the band for that today. It's the uh, tunes that uh, some of us would have been singing and tucking our foot along with. Well, we're going to move in a moment into a time of prayer as we reflect on God's presence with us now. And we recognise again the different emotions that maybe we can see or maybe we can imagine in Jesus' followers in that scene that we read about earlier. And we recognise our own emotions as we think about what God's presence might cause us to fear now. The excitement as we see and experience him and are able to engage with him in different places. Maybe a sense of anxiety where maybe it takes us to some difficult places. But before or as we begin to think about that, I was going to ask for a little bit of help. And I don't know if Maz and Jakey and Ted are coming back in and Ezekiel's down there I can see as well. But I'm sure that the adults are going to help them. So boys, what I want you to do is I want you to think of a friend. So I want you to think of one of your friends Ezekiel as well, I want you to think about one of your friends and then I want you to tell me what it is about that person that makes them a good friend. Okay, so, have you thought of a friend? Yeah? Do you know what I'm talking about, Ted? Yeah, yeah, we've got some stuff out there. Alright, and Ezekiel, so, and I'm sure as I say, maybe brother or mum's people can help us in here. So what makes a good friend? You are study. He gives good hearts. He gives good hearts. There we go. Excellent. A brownie from my daddy. Is he cute? Yeah, there we go. So we've got, we know that they love us. Yeah, because of the different things that they do. It might be hugs, it could be the words they use. Spending time with us. Ted, what, why do you like Jakey? Because oh, he's your friend? Yeah, there we go, excellent. Uh, I wonder about anyone else. Well done, Anna Ross. Let's see if any of the others can help us think about what makes a, a good friend, or thinking about best friends or whatever. What is it about them that means they're good friends? They're always there. They're always there. Thank you, Jenny. Did you read my notes beforehand? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Would it be nice to have that one up? I said they're always there. What else makes good friends? No judgment. No judgment. Thank you, Rian. Can come on the piano. Yeah. What was that? You can trust them. You can trust them. Yeah. They are loyal. Yeah. Sorry, Michelle. They are loyal. Loyal. Yeah? You can trust them to tell you the truth. Yeah. And that's why you're a good friend to me. So there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Where did that come from? I don't know what it's about. They make you better. Yes, they make us better. They encourage you. They encourage you. That's it. Anything else? Faith. They bring you spare sheep when you forget. They bring you spare shoes. That's, that's something Daisy, I'm guessing, has done today. Daisy's my friend because she goes to one stop and buys snacks for band practice up in the <laughs> and all these shares. So there we go. Excellent. Well done, boys. Thank you for my help. Should we give them a round of applause? <laughs> So there you go, as Jenny has already said, and we've touched on and our thinking's already been stirred to think about, I'd probably suggest this morning that a good friend is someone that is there for us, that phrase exactly as Jenny used, and someone who, when they're with us, and I don't know whether this was touched on really or whether someone was probably sat there thinking it, but someone who, when they're with us, is properly presence. Do you get what I mean by that? Yeah? We might be able to think of relationships that we have that are like that. Friends who we know we just need to message or call and they be there for us. And we might be able to think of relationships or times in relationships when things aren't quite like that. 
And I'm not just talking about times when we felt let down, but sometimes we can have good relationships and we're together, but we end up looking at our phones, flicking through TikTok, playing Royal Match, checking work emails, more than being properly present with each other. The good news is that all of our good relationships with friends and loved ones who are there for us and properly present with us are, is that they're just a taste of the relationship that we can enjoy with Jesus. And as I look at the words from Acts chapter 1 that we heard earlier, and as we read about Jesus preparing his disciples for what was going to come next, we read in verse 2, that the Holy Spirit was present in those moments. Before the promised wondrous encounter with God's Spirit celebrated at Pentecost, even in those moments that seemed to be goodbye, God remains present. Present in every emotion that stirred. And so for us, as we think about what God's presence looks like and means for us, now we can have confidence that we have a God who is, as Jenny said of her friends this morning, a God who is always there for us and always properly present with us in whatever life looks like. We're also reminded of that, if you remember, through the words of the psalmist that we heard earlier. I suppose the challenge then this morning is to discover and, the and to discover the time and to discover the opportunities to make ourselves properly present before God. We have one of those times and opportunities now as we turn to song number 766. If you're following in the song of these words of General Albert Osborne, in the secret of thy presence, in the hiding of thy power, that characteristic of God that we easily associate with the promised yet present Holy Spirit. And then in response, let me love him. Let me say everything. I'm just going to go. It's as I think about it now to so much of what we've sung. I said, would you know why I love Jesus? Well, we discover no more reason to love him and serve him in his presence. And it's not just something contained to this place or to certain activities, but it's every consecrated hour. And so if as we sing these words, we maybe feel that we'd be missing out on that promised presence of God in our lives, or we want to experience more of this. There's the invitation to respond to the mercy seat, standing and sitting and kneeling at this place of prayer as we share these words together.
people in the country for your presence with us in these moments. And Lord, I thank you for the stone of your spirit in these moments. Lord God, we went through recognize through those words that we can't do it on our own. And we recognize that it's not just something about this place, but Lord God, our everyday being and living do, it all flows from that place of presence with you now. And so, Lord God, I thank you again for the experiences of your presence and love that we've been able to share, those things that might have been stirred within us during our worship together. I thank you that you are still present with us. And I pray, Lord God, that we will stay responsive to who you are and what you're doing in these moments, in this place. I'm ready for what that will mean, I'm ready for what that will look like when we come to go from this place shortly. And I've got to some sort of an auto summer now. Your word for our days. I pray that in the moments when we come to spend the last few moments reflecting on your word today. Again, we might be met. We might discover what it is that we need to go out from this place living healthily and well in your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. But before we think about those words from Acts chapter 1 that we had earlier, we are going to share in the old prayer as we continue to watch. <laughs> to think about God's presence with us there and those testimonies and stories that have been shared with us. We've had the opportunity to think about how God is properly present and there for us now. And before we go, we're going to think about that phrase I used earlier, God's presence when. And to help us think about that, we're going to look at two things from our reading. The first thing we've already touched on. Whatever we might think about icons of Jesus' feet ascending into heaven and the mix of emotions 
that we can see or imagine on the faces of the different disciples, I don't believe that God was leaving them on their own. Just as I don't believe God ever leaves us on our, on our own. I've said about how the Holy Spirit was present as Jesus prepared his disciples for what happened next. And if we look at John's Gospel as the resurrected Jesus appears to his followers, he breathes his Holy Spirit onto them as he promises his followers peace, having already told them before his death and resurrection that this promised helper, this promised comforter, this promised presence would stay with them when the time came for him to physically leave. But we know, of course, that in a couple of weeks, we're looking forward to Pentecost. And it caused me to reflect on our different experiences of the Holy Spirit and how we're able to experience more. How we're able to know more and understand more of his presence as time goes on. Having thought about spiritual gifts a fortnight ago, I looked at a range of different texts that we might have used in our worship together. And that included one of the first mentions of spiritual gifts in the Bible. Anyone know where to find it? Graham's last New Testament event says so something that I didn't quite catch. John, Speedy Bible College. Acts 3. Acts 3. John, did Faye say something? No? No? Well, of course, we know that the Holy Spirit is mentioned as soon as the second. Second. What was that? No, we did those movie tests. Yeah, that's it. Anyway, I should have put something in the newsletter, maybe, and then he would have known to expect it. The Holy Spirit is as mentioned as soon as Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, where he where it's hovering over creation in this caring, creative way. As I looked into it this week, I thought actually the first allusion or you know, first time that spiritual gifts are alluded to could be Genesis chapter 41, verse 38, when Pharaoh asks of Joseph and his interpretation of dreams and his wisdom and his discernment, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? So recognising these gifts that Joseph had been given and in the eyes of a, a foreign king, another religion, seeing that these things because Joseph was filled with the Spirit of God. But the one that I was thinking of last week was Exodus chapter 31, verses 2 to 3, when God says to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills. And it's an illustration of what I spoke about when we thought about spiritual gifts, because those all kinds of skills that Bezalel was given were artistic crafts and working with his hands, and maybe not the sort of thing that we might think of or first think of when it comes to spiritual gifts, illustrating again that those things that we're good at and might not have thought of as spiritual gifts could be something that God is waiting to do something really significant with. But why am I saying that? It reminds me of a phrase that I heard at the training college about how the Holy Spirit used to engage with certain people at certain times for certain tasks like Be Bezalel, but is now available for all people at all times and for all tasks as we celebrate 
at Pentecost. And then we've got this slight outlier, because if we believe that the Holy Spirit was present in the experience and lives of the disciples in this period as he prepared them for his ascension, and before they received power in Jerusalem, which we'll celebrate in a couple of weeks' time. Well, then that suggests something different again. But for me, the big picture is one of an increasing knowledge and experience of God's presence with his people through his Holy Spirit. But it didn't stop there. It didn't stop back then, either with the Ascension or, or with Pentecost Sunday, and that's the second thing that I want to say about God's presence when we, you and I, are promised an increasing knowledge and experience of God's presence in our lives. Yes, as we get to know him and love him better, and as we spend time properly present with him, but there's also that promise in the words of the two heavenly figures who turn up as Jesus' disciples watch his feet slowly, as you may imagine, quickly disappearing into the crowd. Those words that he helped us earlier. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Stood looking up into the sky. Don't you know he's going to come back? And we might add, and when he comes back, we'll know him fully, just as we are fully known. Again, those thoughts stirred in us earlier through the words of the psalmist. And we can read about it again through the teaching of the New Testament. And so that's what I want us to reflect on as we move into the closing part of the last part of our time together today. We've shared some of our experiences of God with us in the past. We've had time and the opportunity to be properly present with God, properly present with the God who is always there for us. And now we have the opportunity to reflect on where and how we might experience and know more and more of God's presence with us until that day when he will come and will know and experience him fully. To help us as we reflect on that, we're going to turn to a more contemporary worship song that Kay and Kezi read and Mike are going to lead us in. They're words that help us as we continue to recognise this church period of Easter. Words that help us cast our minds to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for you and me. But words that also help us celebrate that on the third day at break of dawn the Son of Heaven rose again. But as we thought about the ascension and this promise of an increasing knowledge and experience of God's presence in our lives, it was the last verse that stood out. He shall return in robes of white. The blade of the sun shall pierce the night. We're back to that picture of light and dark that we thought about earlier. And I, and you and I, will rise among the stars. Our gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. That moment. Just as we're fully known. Norman, I think we need to sing the first two verses and then introduce the chorus and then sing the first chorus verse for us. But we'll follow. Maybe Daisy and Mike can read as we maybe sing, maybe listen, maybe reflect <coughs> and learn these words and then read the chorus. <laughs> See 
we've thought about that opportunity of knowing him more and more in our everyday living and lives until that day when we know him fully. And as we imagine what that might look like, we think of the robes of white that God's followers have been pictured as wearing when that moment of meeting Jesus face to face comes. It's a picture reflected in our closing song, song number 968, if you're following in the songbook. And there are words that echo a lot of the different things that we've thought about in our time together today. And whatever God might have been stirring in you in this time together, I hope something will jump off the page as we sing these words together. These words of promise, a robe of white, a crown of gold, a harp, a home, a mansion fair, a victor's palm, a joy untold. Well, a few of you believe that. <laughs> so let's see how many are believing by the end of singing these four verses. Thank you, Dan.
Jesus Christ for all the benefits thou hast given me, for all the pain and insult thou hast borne for me. And then in particular this morning, I pray our most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I, may we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly day by day. Amen.